Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to delve into the competitive world of video games high scores. Those reaching far back in time to the so-called golden age of video games. We're going to look at the type of fraud that doesn't directly at least target wealth or wealth creation, but the glory and or accolades that go with achieving those high or perfect scores. Specifically, we'll take a look at how one of the highest profile protagonists in this area has undermined credibility in some of these so-called achievements and how false claims of high scores have led to an increasing number of court cases for defamation with people polarised on one side or another. In particular, we'll see how world record scores on video games associated with one Billy Mitchell have been granted, stripped, partially reinstated and endlessly litigated both in actual courts and in the court of public opinion. The Golden Age of Video Games The so-called Golden Age of Video Games spans from the late 1970s to the early 1980s. During this time, an explosion of video game arcades and the gaming industry in general took place before the crash of the industry in around 1983, as people migrated at that time to the personal computer space. Some people actually put the start of the golden era at the point of release of the game Pong in 1971, but the era arguably all started with the release of Space Invaders in 1978. This was hugely popular and in turn led to a tsunami of so-called shoot-em-up games like Galaxian and Asteroids and all this was made possible by the new computing technology that had essentially greater power for lower cost. A move to a full colour RGB took place at the same time with games like Frogger and Centipede making full use of the brighter colours available. These games spawned the growth of the so-called arcade and on high streets it wasn't uncommon for a large group of people to be seen surrounding someone who was particularly adept at one type of game or another. The film industry wasn't far behind and the film Tron, released in 1982, was actually closely based on the game of the same name. Hey, there's been a mistake. I gotta see the guy in charge. You will. Who's that guy? That's Tron. Pac-Man and Donkey Kong were, and still are, perennial favourites and became cornerstones of the era, with the mainstream media following tours of the most adept players from arcade to arcade around the country. Although seemingly innocuous when compared with today's games, there was actually quite a bit of moral panic at the time about the impact of these shoot 'em up games on children. Billy Mitchell. So that was a bit of background to the climate of the day. Let's take a look at our protagonist in this particular story, Billy Mitchell. Well, according to his own Instagram page, he is the video game player of the century, although he doesn't actually mention which century. Anyway, he was and is a prominent figure in the gaming community and became well known during the golden age for his skill and mastery of the video arcade game format and in particular the game Donkey Kong where controversy surrounds his claimed high scores. In 1999 Mitchell claimed to be the first person to achieve a perfect score on the arcade game Pac-Man and this score by the way is 3,333,360. He also held the record for the highest ever score in Donkey Kong and in a documentary made in 2007 called The King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters, he was followed during his attempts to reclaim or maintain the highest score after being challenged by another gamer, Steve Faber. To summarise and give an overview of all of his achievements, particularly in the Pac-Man and Donkey Kong world, we have 1999. 
Mitchell returns to video gaming to try and beat a group of Canadian players who were trying to reach the theoretical maximum high score on Pac-Man. And on May the 8th of that year, a player named Fothergill sets the world record and 90 points short of the perfect score. Mitchell, on July the 3rd, 1999, in response, achieved the perfect score in an arcade in Laconia, New Hampshire. In 2004, he achieves 933,900 at Donkey Kong. In 2006, he was named in Oxford American as probably the best arcade video game player of all time. This is where it starts to get a little interesting. When Steve Weber achieved a Donkey Kong world record in front of multiple witnesses, Mitchell, just hours later, submitted his own tape submission to Twin Galaxies claiming the record. This was then nullified when complaints were made, stating that the high score was only on tape and not witnessed. And we'll come back to Twin Galaxies shortly. In 2007, some 25 years after he first started playing, he set a new record on Donkey Kong with a score of 1,050,200. And this was then beaten in 2010 by Hank Chen, but later that year, Mitchell again reclaimed the record with a score now of 1,062,800. And this is the last time that he actually held the record. I'm Billy Mitchell, video game player of the century. I did the world's first perfect score on Pac-Man, 3,333,360. Ooh, it's exhausting to just say it. I began in the competitive world of pinball. It moved to Donkey Kong. But the greatest level of competition at the moment was Pac-Man. About the person himself, he's seen as somewhat of a self-publicist, uh, somewhat flamboyant, as, and well known for his US-themed ties. Donkey Kong and Pac-Man. This video really wouldn't be complete without a run-through of Donkey Kong and Pac-Man. I'm going to run through the two games and they probably don't need any introduction or explanation to most of you, but I will go through what it means to achieve the perfect score or the high score in the games, which is quite interesting in its own right. In Donkey Kong there are four levels and Mario, or Jump Man as he was originally called, the hero in our game has to rescue Pauline by climbing ramps and stairs, in the process jumping over barrels and hammering to destroy them. The levels repeat with more and more difficulty until level 130 and this is known as the kill screen. It turns out that there's a programming error in the original code which kills Mario after just a few seconds ending the game. So the key then is to maximise points at the time of the kill. Now because of the randomness of the barrels falling and their timing, the exact maximum achievable is not known, but it is estimated to be around 1.3 to 1.4 million. As we've already heard, Billy Mitchell claimed the high score, and it was this game featuring in the documentary The King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters, which showed him trying to maintain this high score against the newcomer Steve Faber. Pac-Man. In Pac-Man, the idea is to move the Pac-Man around a maze, eating all the dots as you go along. There are four ghosts, which must be avoided along the way, Blinky, Inky, Pinky and Clyde. And if you eat one of the flashing dots, then these ghosts turn blue, and Pac-Man can eat them instead. Also, as you eat the dots, after a certain number, a bonus fruit will appear in the center, which can be eaten for bonus points. And during gameplay, the levels get faster, the ghosts can be eaten for less time, and things become generally harder as the ghosts themselves move faster too. Couple of fun facts, the power flashing dots, or power pills, were actually influenced by none other than Popeye, whose intake of spinach gave him uh, temporary superhuman powers. And Pac-Man himself is styled on either a pizza with a slice missing or the Japanese word for math rounded off and stylized. and the creator has cited both as influences over the years. Due to a bug in the programming, there are actually only 256 levels available, and after which an integer overflow causes the infamous map 256 glitch. 
When this happens, the right hand side of the screen turns into a jumbled mess of numbers and letters. Now, unlike for Donkey Kong, the perfect score for Pac-Man is actually known. You complete all levels, eating all four ghosts, following the power pills, and each and every bonus fruit is also eaten. And there is the possibility to pick up some points on the infamous screen 256. And after doing all of this, the maximum score is 3,333,360. In 1999, Billy Mitchell was the first person to claim this perfect score. Disputes in the records. Mitchell's 2010 score was disputed by a moderator of the Donkey Kong forums, Jeremy Young, who noticed that Mitchell was playing on the same cabinet for both the Donkey Kong record and for another Donkey Kong Jr. record that he achieved on the same day. In response, Mitchell claimed that whilst there were some issues with the board swap, and that's when one game is replaced by another in the cabinet itself, this part of the recording had been staged and was well after the records had been t obtained legitimately. Young didn't stop there. On further investigation, including some statistical analysis and game frame analysis, Young claimed that both scores were made on MAME. That's a video emulator, and thus removed Mitchell's high scores from the record. I'll present the evidence on this shortly, and you can make up your own mind what you think about it. Adding grist to the mill for Young at least, one of the verifiers for the record referee Todd Rogers had actually been banned from Twin Galaxies for submitting fraudulent scores. Another doubt therefore as to the credibility of Mitchell, albeit circumstantial. Mitchell appealed and after an investigation Twin Galaxies found conclusive evidence that Mitchell had not achieved at least two of the scores he submitted. As a result, all of his records were expunged, including his so-called Pac-Man Perfect score. So as the controversy around Billy Mitchell's achievements deepened, another aspect of his persona began to emerge, his litigious nature. Mitchell is well known now for taking legal action against those who challenge his high score claims or question his integrity. He sued media outlets and individuals who raised doubts about his achievements, demanding retractions and apologies. So this legal approach further intensified the debate and placed Mitchell himself at the centre of attention both from within the gaming community and in the wider public eye. And as years went on, Mitchell's involvement in the competitive gaming scene became increasingly just one big illegal battle. A notable instance was his legal battle against Twin Galaxies itself, where, as recently as 2020, Mitchell filed a lawsuit against the organisation alleging defamation and other claims relating to his high score records. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Billy Mitchell. Yes, Your Honor, I'm here. Uh, yeah, what case are you here for, sir? Uh, it's uh, William Mitchell, um, plaintiff, that's myself, versus Twin Galaxies. I heard the gentleman speak earlier about your bow tie, and I concur. Matter of fact, I have a West Point tie on myself. Thank you, sir. Now, this legal action marked a continuation of his confrontational stance, highlighting the complex intersection of competition, reputation, and the legal system in general in the gaming world. And it wasn't just Twin Galaxies, he sued the Guinness World Records too, who removed his scores. Now, after facing the lawsuit, uh, Guinness World Records suddenly found it couldn't find proof that Mitchell had used improper records to achieve his scores, and restored them, coincidentally as a result saving itself a fortune in legal fees. In 2021 and 22, even right up to date, Mitchell filed two more loose lawsuits against an online speedrunner called Jobs, saying his videos were defamatory. And one of his videos actually refers to Mitchell as a cheater, using the word directly. And Mitchell also sued the Cartoon Network. The Cartoon Network, what's all that about then? Well, a floating bearded head 
cheats to win an arcade game in one of the programs. And Mitchell claims that this was a transformative depiction of himself. I can actually report that the judge threw this one out, saying that the character was cartoonishly evil and was exaggerated, and the show is anyway protected by the First Amendment. Although I have to say, looking at the disembodied head, I'd say there was more than just a passing resemblance. I'm not sure what you think. And by the way, the character is known as Garrett Bobby Ferguson, GBF, or as some people call him, a giant beardo face. In respect to the disputed records and the evidence that purportedly debunks them, we'll come back to them shortly. So who are Twin Galaxies and Guinness World Records? Well, Guinness World Records probably needs little introduction, but Twin Galaxies are focused purely on games and gaming records, and according to their own site website, they describe themselves as follows. Founded in 1981, Twin Galaxies is a platform that facilitates a competitive community and provides official parameters and authentication for video game playing achievements across all electronic gaming platforms. It is where competitive video game rules are officially set, player performances are objectively measured and adjudicated, and the statistical data of official records and rankings are logged, maintained and updated. Like I said, Guinness World Records doesn't need much introduction, but they are the go-to source for many types of records, from the athletic Olympic type to the bizarre, like the most canned drinks opened by a parrot in a minute. Yes, I kid you not. Oh, and by the way, that's 35 in case you're interested. Perhaps you have a parrot, it might just give you some measure of fame. And just in case you have a desire to be the fastest marathon runner dressed as a telephone box, then you'll have to beat Mark Williamson, who achieved the time of 4 hours 6 minutes in 2017. Alright, I'm just going to add in a few others just for fun. Most layers in a sandwich, 60 by the Outdoor and Events LLC 2016. Most mustard tubes drunk in 30 seconds, 14.7 ounces by Andre Autoli. Deadliest Lake, Lake Nios in Cameroon, apparently killed 1,500 people in one night through a release of CO2. Most garters removed with the teeth in one minute, 26 by Ivo Grosch in 2008. Alright, so I digress. The, the point worth making here is the Guinness World Records is the arbiter of a large number of gaming records, including Donkey Kong and Pac-Man. But they claim to rely on the adjudication of twin galaxies to ensure appropriate rules and regulations are followed in setting those rules. In other words, they rely on what Twin Galaxies says, which is presumably why they had to do a run-up when Billy Mitchell sued them, because they wouldn't have any evidence supporting a falsification or otherwise, because Twin Galaxies has it all. The key thing to remember or to be aware of in announcing or recognising records that are set in the video gaming world are the methods and validations required that are agreed in establishing a legitimate claim. And these include the following, which I'll run through on the screen, but I'll highlight a couple which are relevant here. Recording and without interruptions, uh, because people in the past have spliced the start of one game with the finish of another and claimed records that way, for example. Unchanged game systems. This avoids the situation where somebody plays on modern hardware and software which can be subtly sped up or slowed down or otherwise modified to give the player an unfair advantage. Although using modern software, providing it is documented in the appropriate way, allows gamers to claim records on those platforms themselves. The frame analysis is an interesting one, particularly for speedrunning, how quickly you can finish some games, where recordings are often reviewed frame to frame to frame, and there can be as many as 60 per second, to see whether there are anomalies between movements on the screen, uh, which would be visual in the frame record. Disputed records and false high score claims are the evidence. In 2018, diligent members of Twin Galaxies forums found discrepancies in videos that Mitchell provided to support his Donkey Kong records. They claimed he'd used emulation software to essentially falsify his scores, and this breaches the rules that players must use the original hardware and programs to be eligible to set those particular records. 
After all, emulation software can be manipulated to provide the player with an unfair advantage. A further forensic analysis was brought into fray as recently as September 2022 when a gamer called Tanner Fokens and five other experts published a report stating that after technical analysis of his gameplay, Mitchell could not have obtained his records on an original arcade hardware, the stage-to-stage transitions being too consistent with those in MAME. And MAME, by the way, is the most common emulation software there is. We'll take a look at this shortly. And to boot, photographs from the 2007 record-breaking Donkey Kong run, when Mitchell posed in front of the cabinet that he achieved the record on, clearly showed what was a not an original joystick. It was clearly modified and suggested that it allowed for eight-way motion rather than the standard four-way. So the standard four-way would be up, down, left, right, north, south, east, west, whereas eight-way would allow north, east, south, west and so on to be utilised as well clearly giving anyone who could utilise these extra moves appropriately an unfair advantage. You can see here the joystick used in Mitchell's gameplay and if you look at this original joystick it isn't difficult to see the difference between the two. An emulator program for gaming is exactly what it sounds like. It emulates the original hardware with some clever programming so that you can load the original program and the emulator will allow you to play it on your home PC or laptop. It's not exactly the same, however. Emulators, for example, can slow down gameplay, making it easier to complete levels. Let's look at how this plays into Mitchell's records and the alleged cheating. Well, to me, the most abundantly clear evidence arises out of images of the actual gameplay itself. When a computer program loads a screen, it takes chunks of memory and renders these onto the console screen by passing them through to the hardware that updates the screen itself. So depending on how those chunks of memory are retrieved and then output to the screen, there may be some evidence in individual frames of the gameplay recording of what's actually been going on. And here we have it. Here is an original Donkey Kong console loading a starting screen. As you can see, if we slow this down just to show frame by frame, it's loading the screen in phases over a couple of frames. This particular mechanism has got a a name in the industry called the diagonal slide. Now, here is the same screen loading from Namie, which is the most popular emulator, if not really the only one and there is a clear difference in the way and the order in which the various components of the screen are loaded. And the acid test. Here is the recording from Billy Mitchell's record submission. The comparison to me is very clear. My vote is that Mitchell's screen clearly resembles the main emulator and not the original game. If this is the case, then it is a breach of the rules for setting gaming records. Well, there you have it. There are still a couple of cases in the courts today and Carl Jobs, by the way, who is facing one of Mitchell's suits for slander is currently trying to raise funds to defend himself. Whilst not explicitly recorded anywhere, I do get the feeling that Billy Mitchell, coming from a family with business wealth, does seem to have the ability to fund suits for slander as and when he sees fit, and these are notoriously expensive both to bring and to defend against. Indeed, at least on one occasion, anti slap legislation has been brought up as a potential defensive measure. So what impact and lessons are we to learn from this saga that is now stretching back around 40 years? The Billy Mitchell controversy has actually had a lasting impact on the gaming community. It ignited discussions when perhaps there should have been more anyway about authenticity, verification processes and the responsibility of the gaming organisations themselves to ensure fairness. The controversy also prompted a re-examination of the so-called heroic image 
often associated with the high school champions, and raised awareness that even celebrated figures should be subject to scrutiny, as in all other forms of life. People will take unfair advantage where the opportunity arises. So as the gaming industry continued to evolve and does today, the lessons learned from the whole Billy Mitchell case serve as a reminder that the pursuit of excellence must always be grounded in honesty and transparency. And there you have it, a glimpse into the captivating world of the golden age of video games, the rise of Billy Mitchell and the controversy that rocked the gaming realm. As I, at least, celebrated the nostalgia of some of those classic games and the achievements of genuine champions, I hope at the very least, because I'm a big fan of video games, that when somebody said they've achieved a record and it is truly impressive, then that is a fact upon which you can rely. So as the Pac-Man hand of subscribe chomps on the power pill, that is the notification bell, all that remains for me to say is bye for now. <laughs>